there are some important patterns that you should have noticed in chapter seven and eight. The, those patterns can most easily be seen by studying the three distribution diagram. A three distribution diagram is drawn in two columns. The first column discusses information about the distribution of interest and the parameter associated with that distribution. The second column looks at related distributions and what the, if you know what those relationships are, then you can do calculations about the parameter that you're interested in. So each of these distributions begin with a, a random variable. In chapter seven and eight, we are looking at a categorical variable, which produced a parameter of the proportion of the population that satisfied that uh, random variable, that, that satisfied that category. Uh, or the random variable is a numerical variable when we're interested in the mean. There's going to, let's look at the hypothesis test for a proportion and what the three distribution diagram looks like. The things that we've got in that case are a categorical variable. We're interested in the parameter, which is the proportion of that population that satisfies that category. We will have an alternative hypothesis which will be of one of three kinds. It will be less than some given amount, the proportion will be, the proportion will be greater than some amount or the proportion will not be equal to that, uh, that amount. In this case, we've got a left-tailed test if it's less than, a right-tailed test if it's greater than, and a two-tailed test if it's uh, not equal to. To discover what the situation is, we can't look at the entire population to find this proportion, so we take one sample. That sample has a particular size n, and the number of successes r, so we can calculate the sample proportion, that sample statistic that's an estimate of the parameter that we're interested in finding. If we looked at every possible sample of size n, and looked at the proportion for each one of those samples, then we would get a distribution of sample proportions. Under some pretty mild conditions, that is going to be guaranteed to be normally distributed. So here we've got a wonderful situation. We've got a normal distribution whose mean, the mean of that normal distribution is the parameter that we're searching and that we're studying. That's wonderful. Furthermore, the standard deviation of this distribution is going to be the square root of P times Q divided by N. And we will always call that the standard error. So if we know what P is, we can find out what Q is. And of course we know what N is because it's the size of the sample. So we can find that standard deviation. If we assume the null hypothesis is true, then we want to find out if this p hat is an unusual situation. We do that by finding the p hat, converting that p hat from this distribution, because it's a normal distribution, we could convert it to a standard normal distribution by just looking at the z score of that sample statistic. And then we do the, the hypothesis test after that. So pay attention to this standard error. It changes a little bit as we go from place to place, but each one of these hypotheses tests look very much like this kind of a pattern. Let's look at a hypothesis test for a mean. In that case, the random variable is a numerical variable and the parameter that we're interested in is the average, the mean of, of that random variable. So again, there's an alternative hypothesis with a loop left-tailed or right-tailed or a two-tailed test, one of those three is taking place. And of course, the null hypothesis, which always says that mu is equal to whatever we're comparing uh, the mean to. We take a sample of size n to try to study this parameter. So the sample statistic is our best estimate for this parameter. We look at that sample statistic and convert it to a t-score. The reason that we need to do that is because in this case, we know that the standard deviation of this distribution of sample, sample means is going to be 
this standard deviation, this sigma divided by the square root of the sample size. We never know what that is. So we're going to have to approximate this with S, the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of N. Because we're doing that, we'll follow William Gossett's t-test and, uh, and notice that the degree of freedom is going to be N minus one in chapter seven and eight. Uh, and so we convert this value to a T value, which is just the same thing as converting it to a Z value. You take that particular sample statistic minus the mean of this distribution, which happens to be the parameter that we're looking for, divided by the standard error, the standard deviation of this distribution or the best approximation that we've got for it. And then we go ahead and do the hypothesis test that information. Okay, two more quick examples. We want to look at confidence intervals. Confidence intervals that the three distribution diagram looks very much the same. Many of the parts are the same. The given information though about the population is that we want to find, it, if we're looking for the confidence interval for a proportion, then our random variable is a categorical variable and we're looking for the proportion of the population that satisfies that variable. So that uh, category. So there's going to be a confidence level which will be some percent. We want to do this with a particular level of confidence. So again, we take a sample of size n with so many successes, we can calculate the sample uh, proportion uh, the sample proportion, the sample statistic for this parameter. And we know that the distribution of all of those sample uh, proportions would be normally distributed and there's what the mean would be. The problem is that now we don't have the advantage that we had in the hypothesis test where we were assuming that we knew what P was. So we can't do this calculation, but we can approximate it by looking at P hat times Q hat divided by n and the square root of all of that. In a, high, in a confidence interval, we start in, in the third distribution and build the confidence level, that percentage of the population between a minus z and z. We're interested in that z value. It tells how many standard deviations we need to be away. Then we can build the margin of error because that's the number of standard deviations times the standard deviation that tells us how far above and how far below the p hat we need to be for our confidence interval. Finally, our third, our, our fourth um, example is the confidence interval for a mean. Notice that this three distribution diagram is much like the three distribution diagram for hypothesis testing, but the, the information that we're looking at about the population. We've got a numerical variable. We're looking for the mean of that numerical variable. And we've got some confidence level that we want to build the confidence interval with. So we take a sample and calculate a sample statistic, uh, X bar, the mean of the sample will be our best approximation for this mu. And now we're going to build the confidence interval for that approximation. The standard deviation is just like it was in for the hypothesis test. We're needing to, to use a t-distribution, so we'll need to know the degree of freedom, which is n minus one in chapter seven and eight. And so we try and find a t in this t-distribution so that, that the confidence level is between minus t and t. That percentage of the population is between minus t and t. In all of these, I've given you little snippets of code that, uh, that help to do some of the calculations. You should understand the three distribution diagram in each of these four cases and how the code helps do some of the calculations that are involved. Okay, that's the idea.